Tyranny. It's as American as beer and baseball. This is the America Beer, Baseball, Tyranny podcast with your hosts, Joshua Sopko and Aaron Bloomer. Josh. Uh, Aaron. How are you doing? Healthy. Healthy. Staying good. Knock on wood. <laughs> Knock on wood there. Oh. How are you feeling? Got a cough or a tickle in your throat? Little anything? tickles, but I mean, hey, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the coronavirus yet. Yet. It's coming for us all. Oh, man. I know it. Oh, well. Well, let's get into this episode because we've got some things we got to p- promote first. But first things first, the beer of the episode is spotted cow i did not choose this so i'm a little interested in it oh you'll like it uh by new glarus brewing company out of uh uh, new glarus wisconsin went and toured their brewery here a few years back and it's actually very cool nice little small town uh if you know anything about new glarus you can only buy their beer in wisconsin so i had to smuggle this into the state (laughs) so don't tell anyone uh but it's a good beer um They have a lot of different beers. This is their most popular one, uh, the Spotted Cow Ale. Does it have a uh, story behind the name at all, or is that just... I'm sure it it does, but I don't care. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) It's got, like, kind of a corn flavor to it, which is kind of interesting. It's a little bit different, but it's a a nice little easy drinking beer. Because the cows eat the corn, and then they... Make the beer? No, the cow for the beer. Mm. I don't know. Anyway, anyway um, there's a government warning on the side of it. There is. As all beer is required to do for regulation purposes. Beer is bad. <laughs> also, too, guys, um, it's official that our podcast, the audio version, is up where you listen to podcasts. Yes. So it would be real awesome if you would go and subscribe. And you could listen there. If you don't want to see our beautiful faces all the time, you can listen wherever you listen to your podcast. So subscribe. That'd be awesome. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be much appreciated. Um, and you know what? Tell a friend. Yeah. And do the do the review thing, too. Sure. If you want to review us, great. If not, that's fine. <laughs> But share it. But share it. Tell a friend. Even if they don't share your Liberty views, you know, I think we're pretty, we try to do a job here of where we try to explain things um, so everyone can understand, maybe. Hopefully. Hopefully. But yeah. And and challenge some interesting views, too. Exactly. Uh, Next announcement is we got merch. Yeah. I'm not wearing any, though. No. Me either. Because I didn't do the thing. It's flannel day. <laughs> uh, but so for today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Federal Reserve. Josh put a pretty cool uh, logo or shirt together. Yeah. Oh. It's a big circle. It says, end the Fed. So you can find it on our website, right? Yeah. Beer, BeerBaseballTyranny.com. And there's a merch tab. You can click on that and you can see the different designs we got out there and the Federal Reserve and the Fed shirt is one of them. So if you wanted to know where Josh's stance is. And the Fed. And the Fed. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it comes in T-shirts, comes in uh, hoodies, I believe. I think we've got a sticker up there. So you can just plaster the town with and the Fed stuff. We also have got some uh, ABBT podcast swag t-shirts and hoodies and stickers and mugs and things so i don't know if you like us you could support us that way and have pretty cool swag to wear around and if you don't like the fen the fed this is a good piece of swag if you like us and don't like the fed buy the and the fed and, and, the, and, fed. The, fed and they all come in tons of different colors so so check that out yes uh today josh we are talking about the federal Reserve, yeah, as as USA Today put it, the uh, unsung heroes. Oh my gosh, I gotta <laughs> read this to you guys. There was an opinion in the uh, USA Today on the twenty fourth of March. Says, <clears throat> "Let me clear my throat for this coronavirus." Brave healthcare workers treating the sick have been lauded as heroes during the coronavirus crisis, as they should be for their dedication and willingness to put their own safety at risk. Yet, another group of heroes that deserves our gratitude is the leadership of the Federal Reserve, which has taken extraordinary steps to prevent the global economy from crashing into irreversible catastrophe as business around the world grinds to a virtual halt. 
Thank you, Federal Reserve. Woo! The Federal Thank Reserve. You. Here's doctors and nurses. <laughs> Here's the Federal Reserve. Right on even. Same thing. Those guys in their, you know, multi-million dollar salaries, probably in their nice little suits and pants suits. They're right up there with those healthcare workers that are, you know, keeping the world spinning. Thank you, Federal Reserve. With their gasoline and their matches lighting everything on fire. Yeah. <laughs> so... We're talking about the Federal Reserve today, which you hear a lot about in the news, especially lately, because they are doing it every day is a new headline about something the Federal Reserve is. They're, they're buying something. They're spending something. They're backing something. So you've got like the basic rundown of what the Federal Reserve is for people yeah. that don't know, because I mean, I mean, uh, even uh, if you don't know what the Federal Reserve is, I think you should be smart enough to understand that their job isn't as primary as doctors and nurses but hey <laughs> uh, we're gonna i'm gonna put that out there i'm gonna say that's my opinion but hey uh so the federal reserve in short or the fed as we'll probably refer to it going forward here is the central banking system of the u.s so its job is to keep our financial systems safe and our economy stable thank you federal reserve S thank you so much so what do they do what they do they have four main functions one is setting monetary policy Two is supervising and regulating banks. Three is providing payment services. Four is maintaining financial stability. Um, the, the Fed is made up of three entities. It's the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, which is seven board members that oversee the Fed's reserve system. A network of 12 Federal Reserve banks around the country that do a lot of administrative work. And the Fed Open Market Committee, this committee is jo has job to set monetary policy, uh, is made up of the seven board of governors <laughs> and, the, and five reserve bank presidents. So it's basically just the same people as the first two. Yeah. Like, no. So, um, I, I mean, it's easy for us to sit here with all this coronavirus stuff and all this, you looking at the stock market up and down, up and down, up and down, uh, to say is one, wait, one of your primary jobs is to maintain financial stability. <laughs> uh, you're not doing your job. Be because they can't. Okay. Why? They're they're And it comes down to having a central banking system uh, in the first place. There wasn't financial stability before the central banking system, which is why the central bank banking system was introduced. So there's a lot of really, really rich history into how the Federal Reserve came about, what their uh, role was when it first got started. Well, your boy Woodrow. Yeah, he was the <laughs> probably up in the top five worst presidents in I history. Mean, probably top two. Yeah, top three for sure. <laughs> like absolutely top three. Uh, which we'll have a podcast oh, on that yeah. someday too about uh, worst presidents. But so he, he's, he's the one that passed it. Um, but it really came about that. And, and they had tried passing f central banking systems before in the past. Uh, Hamilton had one that he introduced and it failed. I think he actually had it implemented and the bank failed. It didn't work. Um, Andrew Jackson, for all of his terrible policies, he was very an anti-central banking. Um, and he did a lot of work to make sure that one didn't get instituted. But then in 1907, there was a huge uh, recession. It was a it was a economic pandemic, if you will, um, crisis uh, run on the banks. Banks were closing. Inflation was high. Uh, during this time, restaurants and food and a lot of commodity type businesses had morning prices and afternoon prices mm -hmm. because the money would fluctuate so bad. Um, the banks were getting shut down because there's run on the banks all the time. And this lasted pretty much all year. There's this high fluctuations. And as the industrialization of our country was coming about, our economics of the country and the way the money was working and the gold backing of it all became really, really complex. And so it introduced the need that we needed to do something to keep the prices stable. Mm -hmm. And we needed to do something that would help manage the flow of money and make sure the banks could stay open and make sure that people had access to their money. All of those things led to the creation of the central bank that we now call is the Federal Reserve. 
So those are all the reasons that was used in justification for creating this monstrous thing. There's a really good book. I just started reading it online. I tried to order it on Amazon, but now non-essential stuff on, Oops. on Amazon, you About can't get in. Out. So it told me May 1st oh, before yeah. it ships. Before it ships May 1st. Anyways, the, the name of the book is The Creature from Jekyll Island. And this was the uh, pseudo-secret organization where the seven people uh, got together at, at this uh, clubhouse, basically, to form the central bank. In this room of these seven people existed one quarter of the world's wealth. The entire world. So it was 25% of it was all the rich guys, <laughs> the richest of the rich guys came together. And so, you know, they had our best interests uh, well, in, 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 in mind when they got together. And I've got some some kind of interesting quotes because uh, rich guys about like this just too. giving their money away. Uh, let's see. James Garfield. He was a rich guy. It was a president. I didn't look up to see which president, which number he was or when he said this quote. But he said, uh, whoever controls the volume of money in any country is the absolute master of all industry and commerce. And it was a Rothschild who said, well, it was Rothschilds that's attributed this quote. Although when I looked up to verify the uh, attribution, I found a whole bunch of different things. But either way, 20th president, James A. Garfield, 20th president. So 1881. So long before the, the, so this would have been in the time when central banking was trying like to get instituted. And he's like, no, like we're, we can't have these things. Um, but the Rothschild, uh, even earlier in the 1830s, is attributed with a quote saying, uh, I care not who, if I can control the supply of a nation, the money supply of a nation, I care not who makes its laws. Because if, if you control the economy, you control mm. the, the supply, the goods, the infrastructure, anything you want. So I don't care what happens as long as I can control it. Right. Which you can make whatever laws you want. As long as I control your money, it doesn't matter. Mm. And... The Rothschilds were the ones that were that helped invent and create the central banking system in 1913, which is eventually when it was passed by Woodrow Wilson, who then this is the quote I wanted to pull out specifically. So it was passed in 1913. Woodrow Wilson signed it into law um, in December, so late 1913. Uh, and he is quoted years later. Now, the quote is attributed to 1919, but it's more likely that he said it after his presidency in like 27 or something. To our boy Woody. <laughs> he says, quote, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is now controlled by a system of credit. We are no longer a government of free opinion, no longer a government by conviction on the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. This is what Woodrow Wilson said um, after his presidency. When he has time to reflect about how terrible of a person he is. <laughs> exactly. Oh, okay. And when he realized that he was duped. And then the last quote I wanted to pull duped. out from Ron Paul, uh, who wrote a book called End the Fed. Ron Paul. Woo! It, uh, he says, quote, it is no coincidence that, that the century of total war coincides with the century of central banking. Say that again. It is no coincidence that the century of total war coincided with the century of central banking. So he's saying central banking created war. Well, he's saying that the central bank was created. created, He was saying that the central bank was created in 1913, Mm -hmm. 1914. World War one broke out. Okay. Even though we didn't officially enter the war with boots on the ground until 1918, we were in direct supply of. So he's saying British and French with the central banking, they're able to fund war fund war. And, and without that banking system, we most likely would not have been able to fund the war. Definitely not to the degree for sure that we do today. And a lot of that is so insane of a history about the Federal Reserve, which is unreal. Absolutely unreal. So the premise of a central bank that promotes effective operation of the U.S. economy and, and, and more generally the public interest is what the Federal Reserve.gov says. Yeah. Sounds great. It does. It does. It's really good propaganda. So let me, so it sounds like a kind of a, we're going to protect you from the man type of a thing in a way, <laughs> right? That, 
Yeah. But they're the man? They they are indeed the man. Or they or they're they're basically in bed with the man. Right. Right. I mean, so they and, fund the man. They that's technically not true. They so that's that's the big misnomer about the Federal Reserve. Is it is it a public organization? Is it a private organization? Like what are they? Well, they're kind of controlled by the government, but they're independent in a way that they can operate without government authority or approval. Right. So they can't print money. They can't really issue money. But what they do is they issue credit. So when, you know, in the headlines we're seeing, you know, the Federal Reserve pumped $1.5 trillion into the stock market. How much do you think that costs them to do? Like literally? Literally. I don't know. It probably push two buttons. <laughs> it costs them the electricity yeah. to run the computer to type and a And the couple. guy to push the zeros. It's nothing. Maybe. They created it out of thin air because they just issued more credit. And then you've got quantitative easing, which is this really complex system of <clears throat> reducing the amount of credit. And then they have to back that, that credit up with actual dollars. So then they have to go to the government and get securities from them, and those guys actually print the money to put it back in the system. So that's how we see this market inflation, uh, so economic inflation, and then dollar deflation or mm-hmm. vice versa. It's a string. When you pull on one, the other goes up, vice versa. So it gets really complex uh, and and really kind of hard to follow and explain. Yeah. Well, so they're officially – there are two monetary policy goals of the Fed, which is from their website, is high employment, low inflation. Yes. Again, that sounds great, guys. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. But we know what that means whenever you have a single central authority that says, I'm going to create jobs. Well, it's easy. The, the federal government could create jobs out of thin air really, really easy. If you have a construction project and you want to dig a hole, outlaw the the backhoes. Make them dig by hand. You've you've just employed a whole lot of people for a really long time. You want to employ more people for longer? Outlaw the shovels. I mean, that's so. What are we? You know, <laughs> extreme example, but I get the point. But that's I mean, that's what we're. So what they do is to create jobs is they they arbitrarily inflate the market and they send signals to entrepreneurs as to what they want them to do to increase production. So it's not the market saying we want more houses. It's the Federal Reserve saying, hey, we want to grow the economy. So let's encourage people to build houses. It doesn't. You know, and, and, and they do that in all kinds of markets. They lower the uh, the Federal Reserve banking rate so that banks can loan out money for less dollars. Which uh, is what we're seeing now. Right? Which, which we can get into how that has played out over the last 15 years or so. Well, I don't. Yeah. Yep. We could. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just I, saying we're in a housing bubble. Don't you think? I mean, in a way. Always have been. I true. mean, and they, they created it because they wanted to stimulate the economy. And so that makes it really interesting going back like into the 80s, too. We saw this happen. We had we had Federal Reserve interest rates, you know, central banking rates at six percent, five and a half percent, something like that. And suddenly there is this uh, this market crisis. And Alan Greenspan steps in and he's like, oh, well, I'll just reduce the interest rate a little bit. Um, and that's a really easy lever to pull to adjust that. And people say, oh, well, OK, well, now money is cheap again. I can I can l- get money for you know less dollars than I could before. Yeah. So that sends a signal to entrepreneurs to start investing again. And then the, the goal then is that when things normalize and stabilize, they would increase the interest rate back up again and then always be able to have leverage on that on those dollars. Well, then we saw 2008 happen and they just even prior to 2008, the, the interest rates were already artificially low because they wanted to keep the economy good. They had raised them a little bit. Well, then 2008 happened and they just dropped, dropped the interest rate to near zero. You know, historic lows, we all remember that. And then, you know, it, it worked toward increasing more housing, more production to keep the economy going, which then again inflates and increases the economic bubble and artificially produces a market demand that didn't actually exist. And it created jobs, you know, good job, Federal Reserve. Well, now we have another crisis on hand and interest rates were already really, really low. Yep. So now their lever is much smaller to push or to pull rather <clears throat> to get any sort of return out of it. So now they're having to scramble and say, well, I don't really know what to do because nothing that we could do before is going to work this time. Mm-hmm. So now they're just like, well, now quantitative easing. Let's get cash into people's hands. Let's just dump it out there. Let's make credit available to them. 
at, at whatever cost. It doesn't even matter at this point. I mean, it's literal fire. <laughs> so now we see this introduction of quantitative easing. And so now they're just dumping cash into people's hands, right? They just need to do whatever they can because their handle isn't very big anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, they can't pull the handle the same way that they could drop interest rates unless we see them go to negative interest rates, which is what Venezuela did. So what about, so is that similar to what they did in 2008 then? Are you talking stimulus package now? Or are we talking? So stimulus package is different than what the Federal Reserve is doing. Okay. Well, so those, those so how is how's the... Explain quantitative easing then a little further as far as like, well, to what you can. Best, is, I, best I can. Right? Yeah. To like, how is that putting money in my pocket or the co- country's pockets? They're issuing more credit to banks and they're saying, so we also saw after we saw them say, you know, we're, we're going to back uh, whatever the, the, the market is doing. We're going to go buy those stocks and they can't buy stocks directly. They have to buy like these security exchanges or something don't really understand, but they started just trillions of dollars of created money. They just go and buy them and Mm -hmm. it's all, you know, non-existent anyways, uh, money. And well then, so that's, that's how they pumped this 1.5 trillion in the market just overnight to try and prop the, the the stock market up. Well, then we saw following that Monday, they said, we're going to provide these overnight lending loans of a trillion dollars to the banks. This is actual real dollars of quantitative easing that they filter into the bank so that when you and I go to take our money out because we're scared of what is going on in the markets and are saying, is my cash going to be there when I need it? I'm going to go get it out of the banks right now. Yeah. Well, in order to prevent bank holidays and little run on the banks like what we saw a hundred years ago or so, they uh, said, we've got the money for you. Just just give it away. We'll We'll back up your money. And that puts physical dollars back into the economy, which deflates the economic market, but it increases the inflation of the actual physical dollar because now there's more of it to go around. It's that scarcity type of thing that, you know, supply and demand. I could be completely off here, but I don't I don't understand the necessity of and again, maybe this is the point back in the 1800s, early 1900s, when your money was in your hand. Your money is coins. Your money is gold. Your money yeah. is your cows, your money, which again, we have those physical assets as well, but I don't carry cash. Like none of us carry cash anymore. So all of our money is theoretical. Yep. Absolutely. So what, why I, I just struggle with like, why do I need to hold my money with that guy? Because the government, I mean, in a bank, meaning right. When there's no benefit to me to put it in a bank. Nope. And they're, but there used to be. But there used to be. Exactly. So now all there is is there are uh, seven people. <laughs> seven people. Making decisions. Making decisions who, again, are working in presidents of banks making the decision about where my money should go. And where the government or what I, I I don't I I just it's it's antiquated, right? It is essential to the way we have built the economy now. Oh, how so? <laughs> I I don't. The, the biggest question that that I have in this whole Federal Reserve is if we were to end the Fed tomorrow, what would happen? Like, what would we replace it with? There'd still be if, there'd still be banks that that so that that's that's the really weird thing and it's the, it's the problem that the federal reserve has created mm-hmm. is if i put 100 dollars in the bank the bank can then lend that 100 dollars to you with interest mm-hmm. right while the federal reserve steps in and says you have 100 dollars from josh you can now lend 400 dollars to aaron and we'll back up the other 300 dollars that's called a money uh, money multiplier and what we saw in World War II, everybody, you know, touts World War II as the savior of the economic uh, boom that, you know, pulled us out of the Great Depression, supposedly. And I don't fully understand all the, the systems that happened during that. But I know one thing was they increased the money multiplier, which is just physically making money out of thin air. They are just are fudging the balance sheets. And they're saying your hundred dollars, you can now loan out at a multiplier of four or six. And it went up as high as 12 at one point in the seventies. Like it's just insane. 
I, I, <laughs> what I don't understand. Which creates problems. Yeah, well, yeah, because you're loaning money you don't have. Yes. Or money that doesn't exist. And when someone, when anybody ever asks, I sent this to you. We should post this up in the show notes, too. Uh, from the book, it's the introduction of the creature from Jekyll Island. Uh, it is a question and answer from a regular Joe to a banker, like a financial mm-hmm. banker type of person. And he says, if I give you the hundred dollars and you loan out more than what I have, like, what are you actually doing? What if everybody wants to take their money out? And he says, well, the theory of the banking system is that nobody would do that. That's literally the theory of the banking. They, the banks are banking, no pun intended. The banks mm-hmm. are banking on the fact that that just won't happen. That we won't take our money out. That we won't all take our money out at the same time. That we will trust and believe in the faith of the financial system to the degree that we won't all panic in, an, in, a, in a crisis like a virus because nobody can predict a virus. I mean, that's insane to think that there's some little virus that's going to take us all out like it's doing right now, right? It's not taking us out, but yes, I get your point. But it's caused that yeah. reaction that it's going to take us all out. And now For we sure. see this this economic the knee-jerk, turmoil yeah. and the banking system's like well i don't we we can't prepare for this because our theory says this won't happen <laughs> in a presidential year or election year and man i don't know i don't i now ron not, paul talks about auditing the fed all the time now the fed does yearly audits and I think every four years they do this more significant audit. And that's about more um, just the money transparency of what they're doing. What Ron Paul is talking about is he's talking about auditing more of the the system that goes in place of how they make their decisions, how they're impacting um, their financial decisions. There's So what we saw when they, they pumped a one and a half trillion, that came out on a Thursday. So this will come out in a week from now. So we're talking two weeks ago or so. When they came out on Thursday night and said, we're going to pump $1.5 trillion into the stock market tomorrow. And because the stock market was just racing down and nothing could, they needed to stop the bleeding quickly. Mm-hmm. So they felt that by introducing all of this money into the market, buying up stocks and doing all these things and, and putting faith and trust back in the market, that it would temporarily stabilize and cause it to rise, which is exactly what it did. During that point in time, when the stock market stabilized, started to rise. We won't know this until the next financial reports come out, but it's likely because this has happened in the past, especially in 2008, that a lot of the big market players, some of the wealth, excuse me, some of the wealthiest people in the country moved their asset positions around during this time because they can't do it when everything's failing because that will cause more things to fail. Mm -hmm. So it's very likely that the central banking system, and we saw this happen with our legislators too, uh, there's four of them, four senators that all just dumped stock on Friday when the stock market was up because they knew something that we didn't. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's talking about when they say audit is they want to say, how are you making your decisions? Why are you making your decisions? And how are they benefiting other people that maybe aren't the common person? Why are these seven guys? Why are these seven guys in charge of our country? Like, well, like we said, it sounds good. So we're going to create economic stability. We're going to limit the risk in the stock market and create jobs. Like, well, and we'll call really it, and we'll call it the Federal Open Market Committee. Yeah, and that'll make it sound better. I don't know, man. The whole thing is completely effed. We have seen over and over and over again the decisions that they make cause problems down the road. Everything that the Federal Reserve is doing now is going to temporarily stabilize things in the short term. (laughs) Just like in 2008, we saw a pretty bad recession. The Federal Reserve scrambled. They did whatever they could. They pumped up tons of money. And then in conjunction with that, we saw bailouts from the federal government, which is more of this economic stimulus package. All of those things combined introduced a new bubble that we are seeing and experiencing right now, which is going to be far greater than 2008, but it's not the end of Western civilization yet. It's not the end of how we operate. This is just another temporary deflation of the economic market um, while they scramble to get a bigger bubble. They, they get a bigger balloon to start inflating. Or the bigger wine glass. Or the bigger wine glass. So yeah, that's another example, analogy that I used what episode, when the bailout episode that we did. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, there are three females on the 
committee. So I'd throw that out there to you guys. There's also 10 members for some reason it says, but anyway. We're appointed by the president, and then they have terms uh, on there too. The committee members aren't. The No, the... the like the chairman. The, yeah, the, the chair. The seven people are appointed by the president. It looks like they just like rotate from the specific banks. Oh, they could. From like because they're presidents of banks, right? Anyway, so what? Yeah, so I guess we touch on it a little bit, but like, what do we do? So, the Keynesians, the Keynesians theory of economics is that we need the centralized banking system to control and stabilize everything, to reduce the risk, to do everything that it's doing, to pump money in the markets, um, make us all feel better about the system that we're in. That's what the Keynesians do. And they don't worry about inflation. They don't worry about bubbles. That's just a natural progression of the ebbs and flows of the economy. The Austrian theory of economics is very different. That just works on the business cycle and the ebbs and flows natural progression of the markets responding to the actual needs of the world. If there's a housing shortage, we will build houses for them naturally. Versus the Federal Reserve saying, ah, we want to pump, you know, we want the unemployment is getting a little too high for us. So we want to fix it and we're going to get houses to be built by lowering the the interest rate. Mm-hmm. It's not the market actually saying we, we have a housing shortage or we want more houses. That's just what they're just pulling a lever artificially yeah. based on these seven guys' decisions. So what do we do? We, we, we let the market speak for itself. And we allow things to function the way that they need to function. And even the most prominent uh, Keynesian theorists out there recognize that free markets do better than a controlled market, than an artificially inflated market. That's just where we need to go. And when I say free market, I truly mean free market, meaning you and me can exchange dollars without any sort of regulation. If I want to make you a beer, I can do so without first having to be regulated by the government and how I make it, what I make, where I make, how I sell, all of the things. And then, you know, here's your beer. And then the government says, oh, I need to tax that. Yeah. You know, and then we go round and round and round and say, now I've got a bunch of money. So now I want to put it in the banking system, which is also regulated. Like that's not free markets. So I think in a lot of these types of conversations, people think, well, what, how does this affect the poor people? Mm. How does this affect? It's always an attack on poor people. Right. I mean, for real, <laughs> though, right? Like, and also, how do I say this more politically correct? Not smart people. People who make less than um, wise decisions. Yeah. Dumb people. <laughs> yeah, so I think mine was more politically correct. <laughs> technically, probably, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be more straightforward, I guess. But like, so how having this the fed again in theory (laughs) granted poor people don't use banks anyway but let's talk about the lower middle class right like they're not going around and maybe not making the better decisions but again does it i'm I'm kind of just thinking out loud here because i don't know what i'm trying to say but is it better that these people go spend all their money on mountain dew and hot cheetos or is it better that you know the the banks kind of control their lives in a way they control their lives in a way that encourages them to make bad decisions and that's what it, that's what it boils down to even prior to 2008 but even the last decade or so even, you know, now we're looking at this pandemic and people say, oh, you know, you have you need to have, uh, you know, 30 to 90 days worth of savings, like financial savings saved up. If unless you're an airline or a hotel or unless any anyway. big business. Okay, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, 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 exactly. Um, so the fact that people don't have that is I mean, the statistics are insane. That was a GoPro. It just, I think the battery just died. OK, <laughs> that was weird. So the, the, the system or the statistics are, are kind of insane and like 70 to 80% can't live a month without an income. You know, they, they just can't, their, their bills will, they'll start or save their, less than $400 or something. Yeah. Crazy like, like or, you know, they don't even have a thousand dollars in saving that sort of thing. And that's sort of, I mean, yeah, we can, we can say, well, you know, they should make better decisions and they should be saving and yada, yada, yada. But the f- people like the federal reserve and the, the way that they're structuring our economy is such that they're not encouraging savings behavior. Because they're always trying to keep things good. They always want to have a strong economy and they're always encouraging people to spend money because they're saying, look, 
money is cheap right now. Like our, our, our interest rates are so low. Spend your money. It's fine. Like we'll back it up. It's okay. And then 2008 happened and everybody faltered and they're like, Oh, here's, here's some money to cover you. Yeah. You know, here's an economic stimulus package. Here's, you know, we're not going to let these people. So fail. you can keep spending your so money. You can keep spe- It's okay. Like keep spending your money. We've got it. You know, the bank, the bank's got money. The banks will give you money for basically nothing. You don't even have to hardly pay it back. Um, you know, with any interest. Mm-hmm. So it's fine. Like keep spending your money. And so these other buy that house, exactly. buy a bigger house, buy that car. Hey, you look like you need a boat. You don't need money and savings to be prepared because us seven individuals, we're monitoring things and we've got it safe. There's no risk in the market. So invest. It's fine. Look at the economy. You know, everybody's been saying we're in the greatest economy of, uh, of, of the history of ever. Mm-hmm. And, and anytime I see that, I would always post some GIF about like walls call, coming down. Cause like it's going to collapse eventually. This is, they, they can't just keep going up and up and up. That's not a natural progression of economic times. It just, it never has been and it never will be. And these seven individuals can't do that. They can't centrally plan positivity and growth forever. And let's, let's be honest. They're presidents of banks. Banks don't make money because I have a thousand dollars in my checking account, <laughs> right? I mean, so they're 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 looking out for themselves and their their they rich are. friends and their rich constituents and the people who put millions of dollars in their banks. They don't give a shit about me and you, right? <laughs> nope. They, do they do, you mean your bank doesn't care about you? Because let's look. Uh, when the market goes down like this. Rich people are still pretty freaking rich. Yes. And poor people are very poor now. And the middle class is, is you know, is the middle class. But, like, rich people are always rich. Doesn't matter what the market is. And maybe that's a, I don't know, pessimistic view of it on my end. But I've just seen it where we've been in, down, in 2008 and in jobs I've had. And we go in and talk to people. And it's like, nope. They're still doing I mean, it hurts them. It hurts their net worth overall, but exactly <laughs> they, they still have fifteen hundred x. I mean, insane yeah. amounts more wealth than what the average Joe does, who is impacted far greater. When a when a when a billionaire loses twenty five or thirty percent of his wealth or her wealth, that's a big deal to them. But they still have seven hundred and fifty. Yeah. Sell a car. Dollars. Sell a car. And you're when fine. you or I lose twenty five to thirty percent of our wealth. We're struggling to eat. Or you're looking to retire. Or So how about this beer, though? Well, it's better than the Federal Reserve. That's true. <laughs> it's uh, it's all right. Uh, it is a uh, just a classic beer, I feel like. There's nothing notable about it, I want to say. People are going to be very mad because around here. Oh, is it a big deal? Yeah. I've never even heard of it until <laughs> I walked in. You said I got spotted cow and I instantly, like there's that moose drool too. Mm. I've heard of moose drool. Mm-hmm. And I just instantly so just compared Thinking it of to animals. That. Yeah. Like, hooved, hooved animals. Beers. Yeah. Uh, so there are people who like my neighbor will go to, he's got family in Wisconsin. So every time he goes there, grab a couple cases and sure. bring it back and. Uh, they're canning now, which is really cool. It's a cool brewery. It's a cool company. Yeah. They only brew it and they only sell it in Wisconsin. So like if you buy it in town, it's usually way cheaper than if you buy it on like an interstate gas station because they oh, just sure. jack the prices up <laughs> for idiots like you and me that drive through and sure. and will pay whatever it, whatever it costs. Um, I actually think they have a beer called Totally Naked. It's actually better. But it's a good it's a good beer. I'm going three and a half. I was I was gonna do three and a half. They might actually I'm gonna do three. And <laughs> if they change their can design. This is brand new. This is brand new can design, I think, for this year. This if, is a brand new design. They, if they just updated the It's f- ugly as it's so bad. <laughs> if they updated their font, the whole I could get to three and a half if they just changed the font. And I know oh, that's not fair. Like the font of their logo? Of the whole can. <laughs> I hate the gradient red to like, yeah. like peach pinkish to yellow. I hate the gradient. The, that Spotted Cow logo has been their logo forever. Sure. And like this has been their logo. They've been around for, I'm sure it says on the can somewhere. They've been around for a long time. 
it's this it's this this new glare s brewing and yeah that font's garbage it's like it looks like they pulled it out of the actual garbage i, I so i'm just i'm just not a fan of the design so but that it, doesn't it, relate to the beer you know i'm a designer by trade so i taste based on how it looks Okay. <laughs> All right. So it, you got it a three. Sorry, guys. If you need uh, graphic design, hit me up. I will be happy to uh, let you in on a better font. That would I think well. that's part of it too. Is like they just don't care, and that's fair. I mean, that's, it's it's a good beer. It's not like I wouldn't drink it. It's not. I've had way worse beers. But uh, <laughs> so I gave it three and a half, and I gave, you it, gave it three, 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 three Liberty Steins. All right, everybody. I'm gonna link to the um, and the Fed shirts in our show notes. I'm gonna link to that uh, creature of Jekyll Island too, mm-hmm. the the book that I mentioned. Yeah, we'll link um, to which that, which has got great reviews. Like I said, I wanted to read it in preparation for this, but I can't get it until May. Um, I'll probably go to Barnes and Noble and I can pick it up or get the audio book too. Um, and then maybe I'll post some links too about some of the things that we talked about about what the Federal Reserve does and how they work and sure. Um, yeah, some of the quotes that we said too. So arm, arm yourselves with knowledge that they about the end and the about the Federal Reserve. And Josh says to take all your money out of the banks and put it under your pillows. I'm not saying not to. <laughs> I didn't think he was going to go there. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, subscribe, like, tell a friend. We'd be appreciative of that. And uh, until next time. All right. See you guys. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the America Beer Baseball Tyranny Podcast. You can find us online at beerbaseballtyranny.com and on Facebook and Twitter at ABBT Podcast. You can view videos of our episodes on our website and on YouTube, and you can listen to them on your favorite podcast listening platform. Our theme music is Not Drunk by The Joy Drops. Until next time, friends.